Hello, everyone. All right, hi, everyone. We are going to get started now. Um, and to start us off, Jeanne d'Arc Gomes, the Regional Director for Africa and the Middle East, is going to do a quick introduction. Thank you, Brittany. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us uh, today. Uh, to share our, our experiences with the Africa and Middle East uh, region. Uh, I'd like to just start up by saying that in the field of um, international education, we believe that by sending students abroad, we help in ex enhance cultural understanding by exposing them to different uh, cultures. We hope that they will gain the skills, the ability to interact with people from different cultural backgrounds and also, we believe that the experience abroad gives them the opportunity um, to better market themselves when looking for a job. But I do trust that the location where that experience is acquired is of equal imp importance as well. When looking at the recent uh, Open Door report, South Africa, two of, Af two of the African and Middle East countries are listed among the top 25 of the destinations where students study abroad. But when you look at the uh, Africa and the Middle East, you also see that they are really uh, at the lowest, uh, they, they are rated lowest um, as, uh, with reference to where students actually go uh, study. So we have quite a lot of work to do to be able to give these students the opportunity to experience the culture that exists in those um, uh, regions um, which are Africa and the Middle East. And talking a little bit about the recent visit of the President, of, of President Obama to Africa, that visit conveys the need to advance U.S. Ag agenda in one of the most important regions of the world, and that region is Africa. Africa is, Africa economy is really growing right now. According to the World Bank Economic Forum in its 2013 competitive uh, report, Africa could be on the verge of a takeoff the like of China 30 years ago. It has a growing economy, a growing population which is expected to more than double in the year 2050. African economy grew on average around 6% last year, that is three times the pace of American growth and faster than many Asian countries. So democracy is also an important element that is seen in, that, in, in Africa that many countries are um, fighting for to give people the, um, the ability to express themselves. So what I'm trying to say here is that most of what we know about Africa in the Middle East is from the news. Our students um, are really impacted what, by what they learn from the news and it's important to take time and uh, think about reality versus what is actually broadcasted to us. Our knowledge is limited by what is broadcasted by the news. And people mostly in the West know very little about the Middle East and Africa. This lack of knowledge hurt our ability to understand and engage in international, international discussion. So we are confronted daily with scenes of carnage and destruction, famines and, and war. But we do want to give the students the opportunity to live with these people, to live with the community and experience it by themselves. That is one of the reasons why we are challenging our partners and we are calling you to consider Africa and the Middle East as a destination for your students. That being said, I'm going to let Brittany and Shanika um, present the programs that we have in those countries. Thank you. All right, thanks, Jean d'Arc. We're going to get started now. So first, we're just going to talk about the locations of the of our universities. Number one is Al Akhwain University in Morocco. You can see it up in the 
northern northwest corner of Africa. It's in the city of Afran. Number two, the American University of Sharjah is in the UAE, which is on the border with Saudi Arabia and above Oman. And you'll see that number three is the University of Ghana, which is located on the west coast of Sub-Saharan Africa. Number four is the University of Botswana, located in the capital city of Habroni, and it's located in southern Africa. And right below at number five is South Africa and the University of Johannesburg, located in Johannesburg. We compiled a, a little list of what we think are top five reasons for studying abroad in the Africa and Middle East. Number five, scholarship opportunities for non-traditional destinations. There are several scholarships out there for students who want to go to non-traditional locations. And a couple that we want to point out are the Boren Scholarship, which provides funding for undergraduate and graduate U.S. students to go to underrepresented areas and to study fields that are critical to U.S. interests. Uh, many PATH alumni or ICEP alumni have received Boren Awards for their studies in Africa. Another opportunity is the Critical Language Scholarship, which is funded by the State Department. And this program offers scholarship money for students to participate in a summer language study program of a designated critical language. And Arabic is one of those languages. Number four, a resume booster. Lots of companies are investing in Africa. Oil, tourism, healthcare companies. Now is the time to get involved in the continent, as many of its countries are starting to grow economically. And according to a recent NPR article, the Department of Defense says that the future of defense contract contracting lies in developing countries, especially the Middle East. Number three, inexpensive direct fees. Our programs are usually one to two, maybe $3,000 less expensive than the programs offered by competitors. And they're also generally more comprehensive. Most include tuition, housing, and meals. All but one of our African programs is tuition, housing, and meals. And that our program in Sharjah is tuition and housing. So they encompass a lot. Number two, personal growth. Studying abroad in Africa or the Middle East will push your students out of their comfort zones. These countries have really different cultural and religious practices. They have complex histories with indigenous populations, colonial histories. They just have so much different, so many different experiences than we have here in the U.S. And your students' knowledge about the world will increase dramatically and their perspective on world affairs will likely change very dramatically as well. And then number one, why not? It's always fun to go somewhere different where you wouldn't otherwise think about going and study abroad is the time to do that. So I'll focus on what type of students you should be nominating. Um, I won't, I'll only address this briefly because it's um, embedded into all of our slides, but systems and infrastructures can be very minimal in some of the countries that we work in, if they even exist. Um, this shows up in the form of course selections and registration, student services, simple and even simple transportation just to get around the country. All of our sites sit right in the middle of very traditional and indigenous communities, as Brittany pointed out. It's quite the opposite of what we experience here in the West. It may be a little scary for students at first to step outside of their box, but students who are not afraid to do so will have a very, very good time. So it's really important to make sure you're nominating flexible, extremely mature, independent, adventurous, and open-minded students. I always tell people that in a lot of my country, systems might not necessarily work, but the people do. And if students are willing to understand that and be respectful and have a little patience, they will have a phenomenal experience. Okay, so we will start with Ghana. Um, and the way our uh, presentation will work, we'll go over each of the countries and then the schools, and we'll alternate between Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East and North Africa. So we'll start with Ghana. So travel blogs, books, travelers who frequent Africa have often labeled Ghana 
as Africa for Beginners. I think several reasons um, will tell you why this happens. Ghana is full of color, both literally and figuratively. The, the country's cultural norms, in my opinion, give it the lively image of the Africa that many of us know. It includes the bright fabrics and the patterns, the heavy drumming, the singing, the dancing, and a huge population. 25 million people sit in a country about the size of Oregon, so it's extremely busy. It's a very communal country where despite the very hot temperatures, people tend to spend a lot of time outside of the house and with each other, embracing each other, especially foreigners. And this is, in my opinion, why Ghana has been deemed Africa for beginners. The people are very, very friendly and very welcoming of strangers, especially students. This is why it's really good for U.S. students to have this type of experience. Historically, Ghana is a very, very important country. It sits at the core of the transatlantic slave trade, which is home to several slave castles that are full of history. Good for heritage students and also students who want a deeper understanding of colonialism, dispersion of people around the world, and just the interconnectivity of the human race. As for visa information, students will need to get a visa to enter, and this will be their first lesson in patience and flexibility. The process takes a while. It can take about four weeks or it could take a week. It just depends on what's going on in the office. So I would always advise students to apply for their visa extremely early. You don't need anything out of the norm to apply for the visa here. I'm um, just your admissions letter, flight information, the address for the school, etc. cetera. Uh, Teresa and Susan, who are our coordinators in Ghana, are very instrumental in advising on visa information. As for the country attractions, I will wait until the next slide to um, go over those. So the University of Ghana sits in Legon, which is a suburb of the capital city Accra. So it's about 15 minutes outside of Accra. It's the oldest and largest university in Ghana. It enrolls approximately 30,000 students. It's one of the most respected universities in Ghana and one of the best in the region. The University of Ghana is a member of the League of World Universities, which is a compilation of 47 world-renowned research universities. It's been an ISEP member since 1996, and it's our oldest African partnership, so it's a very, very well-established program. And the program at the University of Ghana is a designated global engagement program. That's GEP is what we call it for short. Um, and this simply means that the program offers a lot of extra benefits that other ISEP programs will not offer as a part of the student's program fee or benefit package. These benefits could they include the airport pickup at Kotoko International Airport, arrange group flights, and the good thing about the group flight is I arrange it here myself, and students obviously have to pay for it themselves, but they get a chance to travel with the students that they'll meet on their programs, and STA, which is the travel company, also offers a scholarship to students who book through this particular flight. So usually um, Ghana students really benefit, they've won the scholarship I think the last couple years it's gone to students who've gone to Ghana. So this is a, definitely an advantage for students. Another benefit um, that students will get at the University of Ghana is an on-site resident director who's on the call with us today. Her name is Teresa. She also has an assistant. And these two work only with ISEP students. Also included in the benefits package are several excursions. Um, there's one to Ahuia which is a large um, village that's known for wood carving, and the students learn all about the popular tradition and how to do it themselves, and of course, how to make a few purchases. Um, Bonquir is another uh, large village in Ghana where traditional kente weaving is made, and kente cloth is traditionally worn by kings and queens and chiefs, but today, um, Ghanaians wear it for special occasions, and students get a chance to try it out themselves. They get to make it on the looms with their hands and feet and also purchase it. Uh, the last excursion that I'll mention is the Elmina Slave Castle and it was built in the 1400s by the Portuguese with the purpose of trading gold and was after that used for the human slave trade. It's a very important historical place and that's just to mention a few additional excursions in addition to the ones on the first page and nine additional attractions. So there are really a lot of excursions that are built into this program. And might I add to some of the most beautiful beaches in the world. Additional benefits, there are more, that are included are the Shui language immersion course 
And from the evaluations, we've learned that students really enjoy this course. They also provide on-campus on housing, meal stipends, and prearranged community engagement opportunities. One thing that we really love about the community engagement opportunities is that the organizations are screened for safety and validity, and a needs assessment is done with each organization to make sure that the students' activities are meaningful and that these partnerships are sustainable. And we know that our students really, really make a big difference in the community, which is very important. Some of the, the organizations that the students can work with are the West African AIDS Foundation, Beacon House Children's Home, and New Horizons Special School. Again, all of these benefits are built into the cost of the programs, which are significantly lower than most programs that go to Ghana. There are a few important things to remember as coordinators. Exchange students going to Ghana are unlike students, exchange students going to any other ISEP program except for Costa Rica. So exchange students will have to submit the GEP fee of $630 um, with their PPAF. That fee may change from year to year, but for now it's $630. There's a supplemental University of Ghana application that has to be filled out, and that can be found on the membership directory page. There are four copies of this application that need to be submitted to us, one original and three copies. Each copy will need a color passport size photo. It should be endorsed by you, either on the back or on the side, either is fine. And again, it's sitting with the ISEP application. If students want to participate in the community engagement opportunities, they would need to submit a paragraph in addition to that application, and all the directions are there. So as for the academics, uh, the University of Ghana is good for students who are interested in humanities and social sciences, as well as health and business students. You'll see on this slide and also in the course listings that we sent to you yesterday, a few popular courses that students have taken in the past. I realize that sometimes it's really difficult to find courses, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa and also course descriptions, but I've been, I'm in the process of compiling all of the most popular courses and the descriptions and they'll be posted online. So this is a start so that we can make it a lot easier for students to find um, courses. And for those of you who send students to Ghana regularly, I know there are a bunch of you on this call, we know that um, selecting courses for students in the past has been very, very systematic. Now students are able to select courses across college levels um, and through different departments, which has not been the case in the past. I'm in the process of making those changes on the website, and they'll be ready for you before the next placement season. The language of instruction is English, but again, students are able to take the Shui language course. And the chances of placement, this is always um, a conversation that I have with coordinators. Ghana typically is able to send out three to five students per year, and this means that I'm only able to place about six students per year. So the exchange space is very, very competitive in Ghana. I take many things into account when selecting exchange students, including the GPA, academic fit, any special situations that the students may have, um, how many students have placed from your school in the past. So if I place, um, I, it's not likely that I'll place a student from a particular school at Ghana every single year. And if the student absolutely cannot do direct, then I would try to place them on exchange. So with that in mind, I take the coordinator comments very, very seriously because these are things that I wouldn't necessarily know from reading the application. So I encourage each of you to use that section in the application to write and give helpful feedback. If you're sending more than one student, please uh, rank your students. Do we have a question? Okay. Um, please make sure you rank your students um, if you're sending more than one. On the flip side, I have plenty of direct space. And I'm wrapping up with Ghana now with a few advising tips. Very flexible and open-minded students will do well in Ghana. I've spent the most time in Ghana of any of the other countries, but it's still very, very different than anything I've ever seen. So students that are good with non-traditional experiences will do very well. Culture shock is very, very normal in Ghana. So for the first few weeks, students may be overwhelmed. Encourage them to stick it out. Also, use Teresa and Susan as a resource. They're very good with helping students with culture shock. If you have students that are interested in wildlife and exotic animals, which I get a lot of those students who are interested in Ghana, Ghana is not the place for wildlife and exotic animals unless you're interested in maybe mosquitoes or big geckos. That's not the right place. Um, but we will talk about schools where students will find this fit. And if students need a bit more hand-holding, 
um, Teresa and Susan are excellent resources and have a lot of experience with lots of students. Teresa is actually an American who's married to a Ghanaian and has worked in the exchange business for 15 years. And Susan is a Ghanaian who has worked with ISEP for three years. So the combination of their experiences work really well for students. So I'll turn it back over to Brittany. Our program in Morocco is at al Khoin University. So first I'll just talk a bit about Morocco. It has a very rich and complex history, uh, starting with the indigenous Berber history population, the Arab invasion from the east, decades of French colonialism up until 1956, and now post-colonial independence. Morocco is a focal point in both European and Middle Eastern history. So for your students who are history buffs, this is a great country to go learn about two distinct regions of the world. And Morocco is a geographic jackpot. It is by far the most diverse of any country I've been to um, landscape-wise. It has coastline on the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. It has the Atlas Mountains, where there's snow pretty much year-round, and then the Western Sahara Desert. It has enormous tracts of countryside with olive trees and orange trees. It's just a really diverse, beautiful country. Mor Morocco is an Islamic country, and students who are interested in Islamic history and culture or religious studies will find uh, an abundance of religious sites to visit. And the university offers courses on Islamic civilization and Islamic art and architecture, just to name a few. So th that, this is a great location for religious studies uh, majors as well. And your students who you nominate for al Khawain should be culturally sensitive and open-minded, for sure. The cost of living in Morocco is much less than in the U.S. and many Western European countries, so your students will be able to take advantage of many opportunities without breaking the bank. I studied abroad in North Africa for an entire academic year and found that I was able to do so much more sightseeing and exploration than my friends who studied in Europe, so that's a great bonus. For the visa, your students don't need to actually get visas to enter Morocco. They can enter on a valid passport and stay for up to 90 days and request an extension of stay. And this will be done, the extension of stay will be taken care of at the same time as securing the residency card. And the Office of International Programs at the university will help your students completely with that process, with the application, turning the application into the police department, um, and all of that. And there's just a one-time fee of 160 Moroccan dirham, which equates to about 19 or $20, I believe, for the uh, residency card. Lastly, I just want to say that study abroad and international education in the Middle East and North Africa region is continuously increasing due to many things, regional interest, in, or, sorry, interest in regional politics, culture, and the Arabic language. So it's really, it's a hot spot for study abroad right now. And at the same time, the number of students from North Africa and the Middle East coming to the U.S. is increasing as well. So this is the time to get involved in the region. The, all right, so El Hawain is actually one of my study abroad alma maters. I spent the spring of 2009 um, studying there. I studied international relations. So I feel really fortunate to now be the program officer for this program. AUI, and I'll refer to it as AUI because it's Al Khawain University in Ifran. So it's the first English language university in Morocco and it's based off of the American model. 50% of the faculty is international and 10% of the student population is also international. It's located in a really small town called Ifran, up in the middle Atlas Mountains. It's about 30 minutes outside of Fez. And Efran has a small town feel, and it's very, very safe. al Khawain joined ISEP in 2011, and since then they've been very active in exchange. In their first year, they sent out 17 students, and we sent them 19. And then in 2012-13, uh, they sent 35 students outbound and received 30. This coming year, we already have 24 Moroccan students coming to the U.S., and we're sending 16 students there in the fall. So. Your students who apply for this program will be in good company and will have plenty of ISEP alumni to connect with if they want to speak to any former students. 
chances of placement are generally excellent because AUI is so eager to send out Moroccan students on exchange. So that's, it's really easy to, to get an exchange spot there. When advising your students to apply for AUI, encourage them to get pre-approval for more courses than they'll actually need in case they can't get into all of their requested courses. And they will have to be somewhat flexible, so encourage them to look at a wide variety of options. And another great idea is to promote Morocco for your French language majors or students with a background in French who want a more non-traditional place to study than Paris or some other French site. The Office of International Programs, the OIP, works very, very hard to support all of the international students. Mariam Inabi, who is the coordinator of that office, is actually, she's joined us today, so she'll be able to answer questions at the end. And the director of OIP, Amy Fishburn, provides orientation, oversees course registration, like I said before, takes care of the residency card application, and organizes airport pickup. So there's a great sense of support there. A great aspect of, of this program is the complete immersion. ISEP students live in the dorms with their Moroccan roommates, which really allows them to integrate into the student community. One thing to note is AUI has a strict dorm policy. Their sex segregated and students aren't allowed to enter the dorm buildings of opposite sex. So there's no mingling in the dorms and just make sure your students are aware of that. Community service is mandatory for all full-time students in order to graduate, so if you have any outgoing students who are really interested in volunteer work, this is a great program for that. They can be put in touch with the community service coordinator at AUI. Her name is Alice, and she'll be able to connect them with an organization in Afran or nearby. You'll see on the uh, chart that we handed out yesterday, or that we sent to you yesterday, the courses previously attended in the region. Um, the strongest and most popular fields, I would say, for international students are languages, Berber history and culture, uh, Middle Eastern history and politics, and there's also a really great women and gender studies program. And AUI can also accommodate graduate level students as well for um, certain programs. As of 2010, the School of Business Administration is accredited by the European Program Accreditation System for its Bachelor's of Business Administration degree. And then in 2011, the Computer Science Program was accredited by, the, uh, by ABET. Regular academic courses are offered in English and in French. ISEP students will take courses in English unless they want to take one or two courses in French. They're, they're able to do that, but they would have to test into the, that course once they're on campus. And students can take a wide range of, of language courses. They can take French, modern standard Arabic called Pusa. They can take the Moroccan dialect, which is called Darija. And then they can take beginning Berber if they'd like. So I'm going to pass back to Shanika. OK, we're moving back to Sub-Saharan Africa to Botswana. And I will try to keep Botswana short, because we actually have a student from um, who studied in Botswana last year, who's going to give us her insight of the program. So Botswana is completely different than Ghana. It's more Western, quote unquote, um, though there's still very traditional systems that exist. It's a lot less populous. There are about 2 million people in a country the size of Texas or, or France. Um, it's a middle income country. And it's been noted as one of the most stable economies in Africa and has maintained one of the world's highest economic growth rates, according to the CIA. The wealth comes from diamonds. Botswana has three of the world's richest diamond mines. And the government is really doing it right. They're investing the money into a lot of the social services, including health and education. And it's ranked some of the top services in sub-Saharan Africa. About 85% of the country is considered the Kalahari Desert, which is the fourth largest subtropical desert in the world. The Kalahari Desert is home to the largest, excuse me, the largest inland delta in the world, which is the Okavango Delta. The desert supports a large variety of economic, I'm sorry, exotic animals, so students get the chance to explore animals here. It's in close proximity to Victoria Falls and the Zambezi River, so like Brittany mentioned earlier, it's really close to travel, it's really cheap to travel around in the region. Um, it borders South Africa, so it's about a 45-minute flight. 
or you can go by bus. Again, it's cheap and relatively easy to get around to neighboring countries. As for the visa information, students do not need a visa to enter into Botswana, but a student permit is needed. Students get that on site, and the staff of the Office of International Education and Partnerships will facilitate that process. And the students need to remember to bring a copy of their birth certificate that is certified, also two passport size photos, their PPAF, and the admissions letter from the University of Botswana. So the University of Botswana is located in the center of the capital city, Havaroni, and enrolls about 17,000 students and is one of the top ranked schools in Botswana. The ISAP benefits include airport pickup, on-site support, suggested excursions, and I won't go into that. I'll let our student talk about that a little bit. Um, but the international office actually has packets of information that they can give students for the excursions and they can help arrange them. Um, on the student's behalf. There's a language immersion, on-campus housing, meal stipend, and community engagement opportunities. As for the academic information, although Botswana is located in the Southern Hemisphere, remember that they do operate on a Northern Hemisphere calendar. This school is good for students who are interested more in the hard sciences and environmental sciences. Uh, most of the students who actually come from Botswana are business students so the business school is very receptive to international students and they definitely understand ICEP's model. Um, popular courses are listed on the, the handout that we sent before. In the past, Botswana in particular has been a really difficult school to find uh, course descriptions and courses for students. So again, I am compiling courses that have been popular in the past, but there are a few tips and comments that will help coordinators with that. The University of Botswana has just in the last month or so revamped their website and it's a lot easier to find courses and descriptions on their actual website. All the courses however are not listed for each of the departments so I'm working with the ICEP coordinator to see if we can somehow figure out how to get those posted but it's a huge task so bear with us all and we're trying to make it a lot easier to find courses and descriptions. I also have access to several of the handbooks with course descriptions. They're very outdated but the course descriptions are still the same so feel free to email me anytime you have questions about course descriptions. And if I can't get them from my own personal stash of course descriptions, I can email Botswana and get them for you. As for the language instruction, um, courses are taught in English, but students have great experience with the Setswana courses. Our evaluations show that students really like those courses. As for chances of placement, the University of Botswana typically sends six to nine students per year. So the chances of placement are a little better than they would be in Ghana per se, but it's still very, very limited. I make my selections based on the same criteria that I make in Ghana. Again, your comments as coordinators are very, very important in the reference section. They help me a lot. As for advising, there's a supplemental Botswana application that has to be su submitted with the ISEP application. It can also be found on the membership directory page. Students who are interested in exotic animals and wildlife will do well here. Students, may, students who may need a few more Western amenities but are still looking for the traditional African experience will also do well in Botswana. You should nominate students who are okay with a little less hand-holding, um, a little more ambiguity, and who are very, very resourceful. There are excellent university resources and excellent ISEP support but there are a lot of international students on campus and staff members juggle a lot of responsibilities. We have a brand new coordinator at the University of Botswana. Her name is Doreen Moketsi. She is excellent. She's worked with the Peace Corps um, for a couple years and with NGO placements for about seven years. She's full of energy and really excited to meet and work with our ICEP students. And because of her background, she's really good in helping students find community engagement opportunities. And I'm passing back to Brittany. All right, our last Middle Eastern program is in the United Arab Emirates, and the UAE is the perfect example of East meets West. It's both very modern and very traditional. It has the world's tallest building, a really lavish nightlife, but it also has strong traditional Bedouin customs and Islamic beliefs. 
the UAE is made up of seven emirates, and you'll, you've probably heard of Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and Sharjah. Those are probably the most commonly, commonly known emirates. The UAE is a really safe and stable country within the region, and it's also one of the fastest growing and developing countries within the Middle East. In 2009, the UAE had four million people, and now, four years later, it's, it's doubled to eight million. The construction, tourism, and healthcare industries are really booming, and the education sector is expanding a lot as well. Emirati leaders are committed to growing the education sector for both Emirati students and international students. Billions of dollars are being put into education. In, uh, in 2001, uh, the as a group of students from Abu Dhabi created the inaugural Education Without Borders International Student Conference, um, and this is held in the country every year for students from all over the world to come together and learn and engage about that year's theme that related to higher education. So that's just one ex great example of how the UAE is committed to international education. And also the UAE is at the forefront of women's rights in the Middle East. The U.S. Institute of Peace recently launched a lecture series with a, the Sheikh's wife, um, and every year for five years she'll be giving a lecture on how women, or the, the importance of the role that women play in this new era of global security and peace building. So that's really exciting. Um, like I said before, Dubai is home to the tallest building in the world. Um, it has an indoor ski slope in the Mall of Emirates. Those are cool sites to check out. Abu Dhabi, which is the wealthiest emirate, has the Grand Mosque, which is a must-see for students. Sharjah, where our program is, is the third biggest emirate. And in 1998, it was designated by UNESCO as the cultural capital of the Arab world. The Sharjah, or sorry, the Emir of Sharjah has a strong passion for cultural preservation. So it's known, it's renowned throughout the region for its commitment to cultural preservation um, and the pre preservation of local heritage. Sharjah also has many traditional souks or outdoor markets where your students can go to shop and really get an authentic experience, Middle Eastern experience. Sharjah is also one of the more conservative emirates. There's a strict dress code. Men and women need to cover their shoulders and legs to below the knee, and there's no pork no pork products in Sharjah. So for your students who love bacon, make sure that they know that they might not be able to get it, well, they won't be able to get it while they're there. Um, University City is where our program campus is located. It's a huge educational complex about 10 miles outside of downtown Sharjah. And it's about 30 minutes away from Dubai. And that is where the uh, University of Sharjah American University of Sharjah, Sharjah's Men College, Sharjah's Women College, they're all located in University City. Students who are placed for a semester or full year will apply for a one-year residence visa, and the university is incredibly helpful with this process. They'll send your student a pre-arrival guide with all the information about how to apply for a visa, and they, they help a lot in, with that process. And the students will also need to get a blood test and an x-ray done before they are approved for their visa. And then summer students, because we do have a summer program there, they'll only need to get a visit visa, which is good for either 30 or 90 days. And no blood test or x-ray is required for summer students. The American University of Sharjah is where our program is. Uh, it was founded in 1997 as a not-for-profit independent institution, also based on the American model. It has four major colleges, the College of Architecture, Art and Design, Art, College of Art and Sciences, College of, College of Engineering, and then the School of Business and Management. And AUS is really diverse. The student population comes from over 80 countries, so it's a really great international location. The international office, the IXO, is, has also a really great team. They have We have Osama, who is the uh, International Exchange Advisor, and he's an ISEP alum who studied at San Diego State. And actually, the provost of international studies at AUS, Dr. Thomas Hochstetler, is the chair of the ISEP board. So AUS is really on board with the ISEP and is really helpful in promoting our programs. Both direct and exchange students live on campus. Um, and there's also a strict dorm po policy at AUS. There's a curfew of 12 AM during the week and then 1 AM on the weekends. Your students can get permission slips signed so that they're able to stay out on the weekend, 
So that's something they should take care of before they arrive at AUS. There are over 70 clubs and organizations for your students to participate in. There's a huge sports complex with an Olympic sized indoor swimming pool, 21 sports teams, cafes, bowling alley, pool hall, all sorts of great amenities for students. Chances of placement are excellent on direct. I say limited, but getting better on exchange because we're really working with Sharjah to send out more students on exchange. And as you know, the more they send out, the more we can send there. Um, already for next semester, they're sending out 13 students and we're um, sending them 11 students for semester one. So things are looking really good with chances of placement. AUS is American accredited institution. A really important academic note is that all ISEP students, both direct and exchange, have to take at least one Arabic language course while they're there. AUS is a wonderful engineering program that's ABET accredited, so I highly recommend it for your engineering students who, who would otherwise probably have difficulty studying abroad because it's hard for engineering majors to complete all of their coursework on time while going abroad. So this is a great option for those students. Um, the Middle Eastern Studies program is very strong. It offers media Arabic, economics of the Middle East, Islamic banking, things like that. And then we also have a summer program, which is six weeks. It's an intensive language program for elementary and elementary advanced Arabic speakers, and they get six credits. And the program combines formal classroom instruction as well as informal conversation practice. The program fee is only $5,400, and that includes weekend excursions to Dubai and Abu Dhabi. So it's a really, really great option. Okay, our last country and last school, and I am going to try to speed through this so that we have time for questions. South Africa. So South Africa's positive reputation speaks for itself. It's a very, very diverse country that attracts visitors from all walks of life for a very good reason, if I do say so myself. Um, there are a few, I guess, very few concise statements that can really describe South Africa as a whole, but I'll try. Um, depending on where students visit, um, and what they're interested in, they will have a completely different African experience. Anything from skyscrapers to villages to townships to street food to bush meat to international because anything the students can possibly think of, they can get that experience in uh, South Africa, which is what makes it a really unique place. It's a very, very busy country and very complex with 50 million people living in a country half the size of Texas or twice the size of France. It's, there's a really busy country. Um, there are 11 official languages in three uh, different capital cities and many, many racial and ethnic um, groups represented. South Africa has a very dramatic history of race relations through the apartheid system, which is a political system that was built on the premises of race, racial segregation. As such, this is a very fascinating place for your students who are interested in political science, peacekeeping, development, race, and sociology. South Africa is also the economic powerhouse of Sub-Saharan Africa, specifically in Johannesburg, where our program is located. Your students will get a chance to experience an economy that competes with the economy of Brazil. 60% of South Africa's GDP is generated in Joburg, making Joburg not only one of the 50 largest uh, metropolitan cities in the world, but also the wealthiest city in South Africa. Any student who has even a remote interest and emerging markets, globalization, and technology will definitely find a promising experience in Johannesburg. Business, econ, and development students who are looking for a non-traditional location should definitely consider Johannesburg. As for the country attractions, this is a huge uh, vacation destination, so there's so many attractions for students, more than this webinar can handle for sure, um, and a lot more than the safaris and the vineyards that uh, we typically think of when we think South Africa. There are eight World Heritage UNESCO sites located in the country and a host of other attractions. As for a visa information, the no visa is needed, but a student permit is, and this should be in hand before entering the country. Students will have to submit a police clearance report, proof of health insurance, a letter from the school, and different health exams. Liesl, who's our coordinator at the University of Johannesburg, is instrumental in helping students navigate this process. As for the University of Johannesburg, it's a brand new and very exciting ISEP program. Uh, the university itself is relatively new in the sense that it's the merging of five different university campuses 
which happened in 2005. Um, each campus has a lot of history and a very unique feel. ICEP operates on three of these campuses. One campus sits right in the middle of uh, one of the world's most famous townships called Soweto. And this university is known for being a research university. And the professors, 90 of them are rated top, uni top university professors around the world as it relates to research. So it's a really strong school. Um, there are plenty of student groups for students to um, enjoy. And the international office is a very, very involved office. Um, just by nature of South Africa being so diverse, the international population on campus is huge. Not just ICEP students, but a lot of students from Sub-Saharan Africa choose to uh, study at the University of Johannesburg. So there will be a lot of opportunities specifically for international students on this campus. As for academics, it's a really good fit for a variety of majors, but based on conversations that I've had with a few of the department heads, um, the geology department is a really, really strong department. This department spends a lot of time in the field at many of the UNESCO sites that I mentioned earlier, and the students get a lot of exposure um, that many researchers and vacationers pay lots of money to experience, and they get that as a classroom experience, which is really cool. Political science and international development students will also do very well here. Um, you'll notice that in the, the, the courses that we sent earlier, Johannesburg is not listed, and that's because this is a new site, and we don't have courses that are previously taken there. But as we get them, I'll certainly update you. So finding courses at the University of Johannesburg is pretty straightforward um, on the website, though some of the different departments, um, their course listings are somewhat ambiguous, and I'm also still learning this process. So just email me if you have any questions, and I can work with the university to find course descriptions on your behalf. English is the language of instruction, but as I mentioned, there are 11 different languages to choose from, so students can definitely get a language immersion experience if they want it. Exchange uh, placement is good here so far, and direct is excellent. As for advising your students, um, the ISEP application must be complete when it comes to our office and turned in on time. The application goes from our office to the University of Johannesburg, and there it's dispersed to a lot of different offices. And if there's anything missing, if that's the passport copy, or if you don't have it, the ID, um, courses, the transcript, it delays the entire process, and the application will be pushed to the back. So it's really important that you have a complete application for your students who are interested in Johannesburg. When you're recruiting students, very, very independent students who need very little hand-holding should um, be interested in this site. So there's a lot of support at the University of Johannesburg, but South Africa is not really the type of place where students stay on the campus and are constantly talking to the coordinator. There are lots of things to do. So students need to be very, very independent. Students who can do well on, in a very large city, a very busy city, should be recruited. And it's very important to ask lots of questions about your students' maturity for this particular school. Like any large city, New York, D.C., um, there is a pocket of crime, and students who are not mature or responsible or travel savvy or any of those words will not do well here. This is very, very important. Um, the last two times I was in South Africa, I lived both in the townships and at the University of Johannesburg, and as a female traveling alone, I was fine. I felt completely safe, but I knew what I should and should not do. Um, I didn't flash my electronics. Um, I took identified public transportation at night and during the day, and I was completely fine. I went running and you know around the campus, and it was great. So I had an amazing experience, and students who are able to be this travel savvy will also have um, a very good experience. As for our coordinator, Liesl is great, but she also manages a lot of international students. She's help, happy to help with the students, um, especially as they're willing to find internships and community engagement opportunities but she will need to know that information in advance. So I want to take a moment to introduce our student, Katie, who studied at the University of Botswana. Looks like Katie, maybe she lost connection, so hopefully she'll come back in in a second. So at this time, we will entertain any questions that anyone has. We know we went through that really fast. Um, but if you would type them instead of uh, speaking out loud, then we'll try to answer them. Oh, 
hopefully we have some questions coming. I'm also going to unmute you, Jeanne d'Arc, in case you would like to say anything to the audience. Well, I, while we're waiting for questions, I would just like to thank everyone for taking the time to come. We, we wanted to really keep this uh, webinar within one hour because we, we value your time and know that you have a lot to deal with in your offices. So we really run through the presentation really quick, hoping to give you the chance to um, address, uh, to ask specific questions that you may have that are relevant for your own campuses and also how you uh, process your student uh, application from, or even how you recruit your, student, your, your students for specific sites. So we would really welcome any question that you may have. Um, we also sent out an, uh, uh, an email yesterday asking you to um, send us any question you have before the webinar. But feel free to, to also follow up with us um, should you uh, remember something that we have not covered today and we will be delighted to get back with you via email or uh, call you uh, if, if need be. So we just would like to take the few minutes that we have left right now to um, address questions and also give a chance to our colleagues from, um, uh, from Morocco, Ghana, who are right now um, um, in the webinar with us to add anything that we might not have addressed uh, yeah. during the... I will uh, unmute Teresa as well in case she wonderful. has anything to add. All right, well, it doesn't look like we are getting any questions, so feel free to give us a call or send us an email later on if you think of anything. Uh, we'll wrap up for now. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us. Um, and we hope that this was helpful and that you'll be recruiting students to study abroad in Africa and the Middle East. Thank you, everyone.